Uh, very good evening, one and all present here. I am Rahul Mijit here, and on behalf of Torrent Pharma, I welcome you all for this PG Bonanza webinar series. The purpose of this meeting has always been to assist uh, all the doctors to prepare well for their exams. Uh, we have been doing this along with Dr. Sudhakar Rao, who has been there. And uh, to take the proceedings further, I would invite Dr. Sudhakar Rao to welcome the speaker for the day, which is who is going to talk on a very important topic. So over to you, Dr. Sudhakar, sir, for the proceedings. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce uh, this is top, uh, why we chose this topic because this is one of the important session uh, after your, after the long case and short case in the exam the last few minutes uh, of the exam will be spent on the table viva and uh, there are many recent updates which are there and uh, last uh, one year mainly in 2020 and 21 many new uh, trials update guidelines and drugs have come and which may be asked in uh, the exam so to take us to this, uh, we have doctor uh, with us, Dr. Sajan Ahmed. Sir is uh, currently working as associate professor in the Department of Cardiology, Pushpagiri, the uh, Institute of Medical Science, Tiruvalla. Sir doesn't need any introduction. Sir is the editor of the Kerala Journal of Cardiology. And he has many, we are, many of you would have read the good uh, the articles in that about the various valvular, congenital, and cardiomyopathies, and which has helped many of the students. So, uh, uh, without wasting much time, I will directly hand over the session to Dr. Sajan, sir. Sir, over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I am audible. I... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, dear uh, Sudhakar, my uh, friend, uh, the organizers and uh, dear friends, uh, thank you for the invitation to this uh, program, uh, even though it's unfortunate that uh, uh, I, I can't travel to Manipal for the <laughs> uh, meetings that uh, they regularly organize. So hopefully after the COVID, we'll be able to uh, meet again. Uh, essentially, I think uh, the uh, events that tra transpire during the course of a final DM or DNB examination, uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, sort of like uh, Pilgrim's Progress. You uh, progress uh, from the long case to the short cases. And uh, by the time you reach the fourth or fifth level, as you would call it uh, in video games, uh, your fate would uh, uh, invariably have been already decided uh, by the powers that be uh, mostly. Uh, but of course, as Dr. Sudhakar said, uh, there are uh, various uh, topics or areas uh, which uh, tend to recur during the course of our case discussions and also during our spotters and vivas. So uh, that is why uh, we think that uh, we will discuss some of these recent updates. And so uh, you will have a set of examiners uh, who will make you offers that you cannot refuse, some of which maybe uh, tell us the current status of this or that, or maybe what is the last uh, guideline that you read or which is the important uh, article that you reviewed recently. So these are uh, things that uh, the uh, candidate would have to uh, endure. So we will uh, go to recent updates and guidelines in cardiology. And because cardiology is such a, a vast and a cutting edge field, uh, of course, we cannot uh, complete the entire areas uh, in the time allotted. So what uh, I will basically try to do is give you a bird's eye view of what has happened in the field of cardiology, uh, the entire spectrum, starting from uh, basic sciences to preventive cardiology, heart failure, intervention and devices, arrhythmia and pacing, drugs, imaging. Of course, COVID can't be left out this season and also look at some important guidelines that have come uh, after 2020 uh, with regards to valvular heart disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrillation, and the rational use of uh, NOAX, adult congenital heart disease, of course, congenital heart disease, due to personal reasons, I can't uh, uh, let go of that. So uh, hypertension guidelines and uh, non-ST elevation MI. So uh, this is what we will try to do. And uh, I think I'll uh, share the uh, slide set with Dr. Sudhakar and uh, uh, those who are interested can get it from him and uh, look up the uh, original articles and the guidelines for details. Uh, so starting off with basic sciences coming to anatomy, I think uh, we would uh, uh, actually wonder whether there is anything really new to be uh, discovered with regards to anatomy, but uh, this year there 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 is a report of a uh, the detection of a, a backup natural pacemaker that has been found in the heart from human and animal studies. It is called the subsidiary atrial pacemaker, and it is uh, 
located uh, below the inferior to the uh, classical sinus node location. And so this might have implications for pacing and for ablation. Uh, so this is uh, the new thing that has come in anatomy of the heart. Coming to the uh, physiology, we know uh, uh, we look at uh, biomarkers and uh, uh, last month, uh, a new biomarker for acute myocarditis was uh, described. Of course, uh, in keeping with the trend, it is a microRNA, which is synthesized by the uh, TH17 cells. And the human homologue of uh, this microRNA has been identified in cohorts with myocarditis and not in patients uh, who have other forms of myocardial injury. So a microRNA is now uh, probably uh, going to be the best uh, biomarker uh, for acute myocarditis. Now, uh, again, in physiology, we know, of course, we use uh, the NT-pro BNP and the BNP, but now people have started looking at the NT-pro BNP to BNP ratio. And in the class, uh, in the ARNI trial, the Paradigm HF trial, the ratio was uh, hovering around six is to one. And it is now uh, seen that uh, this may have prognostic value in patients with atrial fibrillation and heart failure may have higher ratio of NT-pro BNP to BNP of more than eight. So uh, this uh, is an evolving uh, biomarker ratio. And uh, coming to biochemistry, of course, uh, we have the urinary sodium uh, as a biomarker in heart failure. And so this is an article which came in 2020 in the European Heart Journal. And so in a nutshell, it means that uh, when somebody is admitted with a heart failure and you treat that patient with diuretic, which is guided by fluid-based metrics, uh, after the initial few hours, you, we do a urine spot sodium estimation. And if the urine sodium is above a particular threshold value, it indicates effective decongestion and a favorable outcome. While if the urine sodium is below a particular threshold value, it indicates an insufficient response, persistent congestion, and a risk of worsening heart failure and higher mortality. So uh, overall, urine sodium being high after diuretic therapy in heart failure is good, and low urine sodium is bad. In fact, this was uh, actually included in a position paper from the ESC uh, on diuretics in heart failure. And uh, they had said that in on day one, uh, we give the loading dose of uh, loop diuretic, empty the bladder prior to administration of the diuretic, collect the urine and do a urine spot sodium at uh, two hours and measure the urine output. If the urine spot sodium after diuresis is less than 50 to 70 millimole per liter, or if the urine output is less than 100 ml per hour, it calls for a stepped pharmacological therapy and intensification of loop diuretic. And by day two, if still the diuretic response is slow, we can double the loop diuretic dose. And once the maximum dose is reached, we have to go for combination therapy and sequential nephron blockade. The agents uh, recommended are thiazides or metalazone, acetazolamide or amyloride. And as a third line agent, the uh, new uh, champions, the SGLT2 inhibitors. Coming to uh, microbiology uh, and heart, uh, we have uh, the gut microbiome and its uh, cardiovascular uh, relationship, especially to heart failure and coronary artery disease that has been described. So the best way to a man's heart is through his uh, uh, gut, people said, and probably it is true uh, with the uh, elucidation of the mechanisms, which include an increased amount of uh, trimethyl amine oxide, which is uh, produced in the gut and which promotes atherosclerosis. And also uh, by a low intestinal level of the short chain fatty acid that is butyrate, which will promote uh, inflammation in the gut and also lead to systemic inflammation and worsening of atherosclerosis and heart failure. So people are now looking at how to modulate the gut to improve cardiovascular outcomes. Of course, preventive cardiology should uh, never be forgotten. And uh, the tobacco uh, epidemic is uh, one which is very often forgotten when we consider the uh, conventional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. In fact, yesterday I had done a PCI for a 36-year-old male who uh, had a very 99% uh, stenosis of the LAD and the risk factor was uh, mainly smoking. So tobacco uh, should not be forgotten. And now uh, we have the MPOWER uh, acronym, uh, or uh, uh, which includes monitoring, uh, tobacco use and prevention policies, P for protecting people from tobacco smoke, both uh, direct and passive. Then O is for offering help to quit tobacco use. W is uh, warning about the dangers of tobacco. E is for enforcing bans on advertising promotion and sponsorship. And R is for raising taxes on tobacco for effective control. So this is the Empower Roadmap for Tobacco Eradication. Coming to uh, exercise and sports, uh, we, I think uh, many of you would have watched uh, Djokovic's uh, superb match uh, a couple of days ago. So this is the 2020 uh, ESC guideline on sports cardiology and exercise. And so uh, this is the general recommendation for exercise and sports in healthy individuals, something that uh, even uh, cardiologists like me also uh, 
find it difficult to follow, unfortunately. So it is at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity, or if it is vigorous intensity, is 75 minutes per week or an equivalent combination. So uh, that is the recommendation. And uh, the last point, multiple sessions of exercise spread throughout the week. That is on four to five days a week. Uh, at least and uh, preferably every day of the week are recommended. So that is the guideline for uh, exercise. Now coming to uh, hypertension, the International Society of Hypertension, Global Hypertension Practice Guidelines came in 2020. The problem with these guidelines is by the time we read and finish and imbibe one, the next one comes along. So we will just look at the main points. One is the classification of hypertension uh, based on the office blood pressure and uh, uh, important thing, uh, I think Dr. D. Pravagaran is also one of the authors of this uh, article. So uh, classification based on office BP, normal BP is defined as 130 by less than 130 by less than uh, 85. And you have grade one hypertension that is 140, 90 and above and grade two hypertension is 160 by 100 and above. So that is uh, pretty decent. Then you have the high normal BP, which ranges from 130 to 139 and 85 to 89. Based on the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, the 24 hour average, we can take uh, 130 by 80. And if it is during daytime, we will add five. And if it is uh, during nighttime, uh, it is 120 by 70. And based on the home BP monitoring, the cutoff is five millimeter more than the ambulatory BP monitoring. That is 135 by 85. Now, what are the targets? Uh, the essential target is uh, a BP reduction, ideally to less than 140 by 90. And this aim for BP control is within three months. And optimally, if the patient is uh, below 65 years, so if the patient is younger, you can target the BP to less than 130 by 80 if it, uh, if it is tolerated, but it should be maintained above 120 by 70. So that is a, a slightly different, but uh, uh, sensible sounding recommendation. So 140 by 90 standard, 130 by 80 in younger patients, but maintain above 120 by 70. Coming to the drug treatment, we have the different groups of drugs. We have uh, A, of course, stands for ACE inhibitor or ARB. C stands for uh, the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Uh, D stands for diuretic. So if you have uh, a step one, that is a dual low dose combination. So ideally what uh, the guidelines recommend is a single pill combination therapy which is called the SPC. So first step one is dual low dose combination. Step two is a dual full dose combination. Step three, so step three is three drug combination, easy to remember. And step four is for persistent hypertension with a triple combination along with spironolactone. So uh, at a dose from 12.5 to 50 milligram once daily. And uh, you, we can use thiazide diuretics if thiazide like diuretics are not available. And uh, very importantly, uh, consider beta blockers at any treatment step, especially when there is a specific indication for their use. Classically in heart failure, angina, post myocardial infarction, atrial fibrillation, or younger women uh, who are pregnant or are planning pregnancy. Additional drugs that are mentioned are amyloride, doxazosin, aplerinone, alpha blockers, clonidine, uh, and uh, of course beta blockers. Coming to uh, dyslipidemia, we had the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines in 2021, and uh, uh, they recommend that all uh, human beings above the age of 40 years should be screened for dyslipidemia, uh, or uh, regardless of age, any patient with uh, any risk factor for atherosclerosis should be screened. So how to screen uh, lipoprotein, uh, the standard recommendations uh, hold true. An additional thing is uh, they recommend lipoprotein A uh, little a estimation once in a patient's lifetime with the initial screening and non-fasting lipid testing is recommended in most adults for screening. The additional thing that uh, they have mentioned is a new uh, drug that is the icosapent ethyl which uh, should be considered in patients in whom the triglyceride is uh, above 135 to 499 milligram per deciliter and uh, the dose is 2 gram twice daily and uh, this may also be given in patients without ACVD but with diabetes and uh, those who have additional cardiovascular risk factors and this is uh, essentially based on the reduce it group of trials which was uh, one of the first uh, non-LDL targeted trials to show a cardiovascular benefit and was uh, actually uh, uh, projected to be likely uh, likely to be featured in future guidelines as has now uh, happened. Now, coming to the uh, important uh, guideline on valvular heart disease, which was released in 2020 by the ACCAHA, of course, very important uh, uh, for the uh, 
clinical case also. But also remember that uh, we uh, read updates and guidelines, not just for uh, getting through the exam, because the quality of our care for our patients also depends upon uh, how much we are uh, in tune with the latest development. So uh, stages of valvular heart disease, the classical A, B, C, and D. Uh, a is at risk, B is progressive, C is asymptomatic severe, and D is symptomatic severe. So that is common for all valvular heart diseases. So uh, stages of AS, I'll uh, just uh, tell you the stage A uh, is at risk of AS, stage B is progressive AS. Then you have C, that is asymptomatic severe AS, and stage D is symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. In C itself, you have C1 and C2. C1 is asymptomatic severe AS, uh, and uh, C2 is with LV systolic dysfunction. In D, that is symptomatic severe AS, you have the classical symptomatic severe high gradient AS, which is D1. Symptomatic severe low flow, low gradient AS with reduced ejection fraction, that is D2. And the symptomatic severe low gradient AS with normal ejection fraction or the paradoxical low flow severe AS, which is stage D3. Now, uh, regarding the management, we won't go into the details, but we, of course, know that uh, when somebody has severe symptomatic aortic stenosis with a velocity of more than 4 meter per second, mean gradient more than 40, it calls for aortic valve replacement either surgically by SAVR or through transcatheter, that is TAVI or TAVR. Uh, if patients uh, are not symptomatic, we look at other factors, including LV systolic dysfunction. The EF cutoff is 50%, whether the patient is undergoing other cardiac surgery or whether the patient has an abnormal response to exercise. So additional factors when you look at uh, for class 2A recommendation are uh, very severe AS with a velocity of more than 5 meter per second, uh, three times elevated BNP, or rapid disease progression in a patient with low surgical risk. So this is the overall approach to aortic stenosis. So if you decide on a surgical aortic valve replacement, the next step is to decide on whether it is a mechanical versus a bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement. Whenever uh, we can't use VK or vitamin K antagonist in any patient, of course, the natural choice is a bioprosthetic valve. Now, based on the age, if the patient is less than 50 years of age, we prefer a mechanical valve because it is more durable. If the patient is more than 65 years, we prefer a bioprosthetic valve after discussion with the patient. While if it is between 50 to 65 years, we have to individualize based on multiple factors, including comorbidities and bleeding risk. Now, what about uh, uh, surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcatheter? In a patient in whom the age is less than 65 years or if the life expectancy is really good, more than 20 years, surgical aortic valve replacement is preferred. That is a class 1A recommendation. Between 65 to 80 years, they are mostly equal. Surgical AVR is almost equal to transfemoral clavi. So that is again class 1 recommendation. While if the patient is an octogenarian, about 80 years with a life expectancy of uh, less than 10 years, transfemoral TAVI is better than surgical valve replacement. That is again class 1. At any age when there is a prohibitive surgical risk and the predicted survival is more than one year with an acceptable quality of life, the recommendation is for TAVI. While the last point is also important in someone in whom the predicted survival is less than one year and if you expect only minimal improvement in the quality of life, palliative care is recommended rather than surgical or transcatheter valve replacement. So that's about aortic stenosis. We come to chronic aortic regurgitation. Again, you have at risk progressive symptomatic severe AR and symptomatic severe aortic regurgitation. Now in AR also, if you have severe aortic regurgitation and the patient is symptomatic, of course, we go for aortic valve replacement. If the patient is asymptomatic, we look at other factors like a reduction in EF. Here, the cutoff is 55%, whether the patient is undergoing other cardiac surgery. And if there is uh, LV systolic and systolic dimension more than 50 or more than 25 millimeter per meter square. So these are the parameters we look at. And here the AVR recommendation also comes. What about aortic imaging in, <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, what about aortic imaging in a patient with uh, bicuspid aortic valve? So if the on transthoracic echo, you find that uh, the aortic diameter, the sinus or the ascending aorta is more than four centimeters. We have to periodically image the patient with a transthoracic echo, a cardiac MRI or a CT aortogram with uh, an interval determined by the degree and rate of progression of the aortic dilatation. So somebody with a bicuspid aortic valve, if the aortic sinus or ascending aortic diameter is more than 5.5 centimeter, we have to go for replacement of the aortic sinus and or the ascending aorta. 
the cutoff is 5 to 5.5 if there is an additional risk factor for dissection. And this would include a family history of aortic dissection, a rapid rate of progression of more than 0.5 centimeter per year, and associated coarctation of aorta. So usually it is 5.5, above 5 if there is an additional risk factor. Next, coming to mitral stenosis, uh, again, stage uh, A, at risk, progressive, asymptomatic, severe mitral stenosis, and symptomatic severe mitral stenosis. Here, the valve area is less than 1.5, unlike the conventional one centimeter square to which we were used to. Now, what about medical therapy for mitral stenosis? In somebody with rheumatic MS, what are the indications uh, for anticoagulation? Of course, with a VKA in MS, one is atrial fibrillation, second is an LA thrombus, and third, very importantly, that's even in sinus rhythm, if there is a prior embolic event in a patient with MS, it is an indication for anticoagulation. And in patients with MS and atrial fibrillation or in normal sinus rhythm, a heart rate control can be beneficial, and most commonly, it is done with the use of beta blockers. So in rheumatic mitral stenosis, if it is severe symptomatic mitral stenosis, the valve is pliable, no clot, mild MR, suitable for BMB, we go for percutaneous uh, balloon uh, valve water. Additional factors we look for are a PA systolic pressure of more than 50 and a new onset AF, even in a patient with a symptomatic, in a class 2A recommendation if the valve is suitable for balloon treatment. Coming to mitral regurgitation, you can have primary MR and secondary MR. Primary MR can be at risk, progressive, asymptomatic, severe MR or symptomatic, severe MR. Now in primary MR, if it is symptomatic, severe mitral regurgitation, regardless of the LV function, we can go for mitral valve surgery. And if repair is possible, it is uh, recommended over replacement. But if there are no symptoms, we look at additional factors, especially LV systolic dysfunction, where the EF cutoff is 60%. Remember that EF less than 60% should be considered and an end systolic dimension of more than 40 millimeters should be considered as significant. Now in secondary MR also the same stages apply, but here we uh, look at uh, the heart failure therapy, especially because most cases of secondary MR will be associated with uh, diseases that produce heart failure. So if the patient undergoes CABG and has a severe mitral regurgitation, it becomes a class 2A recommendation for mitral valve surgery. Uh, additionally, then you look at the ejection fraction if it is below or above 50%. If the ejection fraction is less than 50%, the patient has persistent sy symptoms on uh, treatment for heart failure. The EF is ranging between 20 to 50%. If the end systolic dimension is less than 70 and the PA systolic pressure is less than 70, you can consider transcatheter H2H -H mitral valve repair. So these factors should be considered. The ejection fraction, end systolic dimension and the PA systolic pressure of less than 70. Coming to tricuspid regurgitation, you have progressive TR, asymptomatic severe TR and symptomatic severe TR. If there is severe TR with right heart failure, and if the patient is undergoing a left-sided valve surgery, uh, as in the case of rheumatic valvular heart disease, we have to go ahead for a tricuspid valve surgery. Uh, at the time of left-sided valve surgery, if there is progressive TR, and uh, if you have an annular dilatation of more than four centimeter or a previous history of right heart failure, again, it's a class 2A recommendation for tricuspid valve surgery. So these are the important indications. What about the prosthetic valve choice? So whether it is aortic or mitral valve, we have to consider the age, if it is less than 50 or uh, above 65. Uh, the younger the patient, more in favor of mechanical AVR, while the older the patient, the more in favor of bioprosthetic valve. Now, what about the antithrombotic therapy for prosthetic valve? If you use a mechanical valve, whether it is uh, AVR or a mitral uh, valve replacement, the INR goal for aortic valve replacement with no other risk factor is 2.5. While if there is additional risk factor, the INR goal is 3. While for mechanical valve, it is a uh, standard of 3. So aortic, if there is low risk, the target is 2.5. Standard is uh, overall for... Uh, 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 to remember easily, it is uh, three. And if antiplatelet therapy is indicated, uh, we add low dose aspirin, usually 75 milligram is added. In case of a bioprosthetic valve, the initial uh, first three to six months, uh, vitamin K anticoagulation with an INR goal of 2.5 is used, after which a lifelong therapy with that low dose aspirin, 75 milligram is used. Uh, after TAVI, uh, initial three to six months, if the patient is at low risk of bleed, dual antiplatelet therapy is recommended. That is only class 2B. And a VK of, uh, uh, with an INR goal of 2.5, that's only class 2B. It's an evolving area. And we don't yet have the final answer, which is the best anticoagulation strategy after TAVI. 
Now coming to management of embolic events and thrombosis in prosthetic valves. In somebody with a prosthetic heart valve has a thromboembolic event. And if the patient has an aortic mechanical valve and you find that the INR is in range, the uh, next step is to increase the INR goal to three or add aspirin, low dose aspirin. If it is mitral mechanical with INR in range, we may increase the INR goal up to four or add aspirin. And if it is a bioprosthetic AVR or MVR on antiplatelet therapy, consider changing to a VK anticoagulation instead of an antiplatelet treatment. Now, if there is a suspected mechanical valve thrombosis uh, and if there is a left-sided mechanical obstruction, there are two options, urgent slow infusion fibrinolytic therapy or going for emergency surgery it depends upon multiple factors. If it is a suspected bioprosthetic valve thrombosis, initial treatment with vitamin K antagonist is reasonable. Now, what about prosthetic valve dysfunction, which can be either valve stenosis or valve regurgitation? If there is suspected valve stenosis, if and it is symptomatic, based on whether it is a mechanical or a bioprosthetic valve, we can decide for a surgical or a transcatheter valve in valve intervention. In case of a suspected valvular regurgitation, if there is intractable hemolysis or heart failure, and if the surgical risk is not very high, the recommendation is to go ahead for surgical intervention. Otherwise, we may consider transcatheter interventions. What about surgery for uh, atrial fibrillation per se in patients who undergo surgery for valvular heart disease? So somebody who is undergoing a surgical valve intervention, having atrial fibrillation, and uh, we can discuss the benefits and risks of adjunctive AF procedure. And these are all class 2A recommendations, that is uh, concomitant surgical pulmonary vein isolation or maze procedure, left atrial appendage ligation or excision, and uh, we should continue with anticoagulation therapy for at least three months after the procedure. But in somebody who does not have atrial fibrillation, just doing an LA appendage ligation or excision for the sole purpose of preventing thromboembolism later if the patient develops atrial fibrillation is a class three recommendation. We should not be doing that. Now coming to uh, pregnancy with uh, a, a patient who is pregnant, has a mechanical valve and who is on vitamin K antagonist. So how do you manage the anticoagulation prior to the delivery? We have to change to low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin at least one week before the planned delivery. Then change to IV unfractionated heparin at least 36 hours before delivery and stop the unfractionated heparin at least six hours before the planned delivery. So that's about that. And then uh, the guideline uh, uh, has a revision of the Duke criteria for infective endocarditis. You have the, uh, it is, we always read it, but always find it very difficult to remember and have to read it on the day before the exam, definitely. So we have the definite criteria, the pathological criteria uh, uh, and the clinical criteria. You have possible and rejected IE. You have major criteria, blood culture positivity, evidence of endocardial involvement. And you have the minor criteria, which are the predisposing condition, the fever, vascular phenomena, immunological phenomena, and the microbiological evidence. Now, regarding the treatment of endocarditis, I will just go to this, uh, the area which has been marked, the considerations for early surgery in patients with endocarditis. So the guidelines recommend that if patient has significant valve dysfunction causing heart failure, or if the, the IE is caused by staph aureus, fungal, or other highly resistant organism, or if there is a complication of heart block, annular or aortic abscess, or penetrating lesion, or there is persistent infection, bacteremia or fever, more than five days after antibiotic therapy, we have to consider early surgery. The second important thing is if there is a definite endocarditis in a patient with an implanted cardiac electronic device, as in a pacemaker or any other device, complete removal of the leads and the generator is recommended. And if somebody has a prosthetic valve endocarditis with a relapsing infection, again, the indication for surgery is very, very strong. So these are the major recommendations. The guidelines then, uh, go through the secondary prevention of rheumatic fever once again, the antibiotics, including pen penicillin G, penicillin V, sulfadiazine, and the macrolide uh, antibiotic. And then the duration of the secondary uh, prophylaxis, uh, rheumatic fever with carditis and uh, residual heart disease, 10 years or 40 years, whichever is longer. With carditis, no residual heart disease, 10 years or 21 years, whichever is longer. And rheumatic fever without carditis, five years or until 21 years, whichever is longer. So. Uh, these are things that are very, very important and uh, which we tend to forget. 
Now, uh, regarding infective endocarditis prophylaxis, as per the current status, the class 2A recommendation is reasonable before dental procedures involving manipulation of gingival tissue, manipulation of periapical region, or perforation of the mucosa in uh, five specific situations. One is prosthetic cardiac valve, including the transcatheter processes and homograft. Prosthetic material used for cardiac valve repair, like aniloplasty rings, cords, or clips previous endocarditis, unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease or repaired congenital heart disease who have residual shunts or valvular regurgitation at the site of or adjacent to the site of a prosthetic patch or prosthetic device. Then you have cardiac transplant with valve regurgitation. So these are the indications. And it is not uh, recommended for non-dental procedures. <coughs> now, coming to... Uh, Another important uh, and uh, favorite area uh, uh, of uh, examiners is uh, the operative mortality rate, which is standard. And this uh, guideline gives the data from the Society of uh, Thoracic Surgeons 2019 database. The mortality rate of AVR is 2.2 double with the CABG. Uh, mitral valve replacement is five, almost double uh, when you combine AVR and mitral valve replacement and CABG and the mitral valve repair, very low mortality rate of 1%. Mitral valve repair with CABG again, 5%. So this is the mortality rate. Now, uh, uh, in tune with the times, we have a make in India moment when uh, uh, the contemporary diagnosis of rheumatic heart disease, uh, scientific statement from AHA, the lead author, uh, 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 Dr. Krishna Kumar from Amrita. So, uh, they have clearly defined the uh, RHD uh, groups, latent rheumatic heart disease, uh, clinical rheumatic heart disease with signs and symptoms, including murmur, and subclinical rheumatic heart disease who do not have uh, signs and symptoms, including heart murmurs. And they have described the progression from healthy individuals to subclinical RHD to asymptomatic but clinically manifest RHD to symptomatic rheumatic heart disease and advanced rheumatic heart disease. And uh, uh, there is a, a good table with the duration of secondary prophylaxis, which you can refer. I uh, will just refer to the Australian the recent the latest uh, guideline that is 2020 Australian guidelines, where they have uh, divided into possible acute rheumatic fever, probable or uh, definite without carditis, borderline rheumatic heart disease. And then they have divided the uh, RHD into mild, moderate, and severe, and then uh, changing the uh, duration based upon the severity of rheumatic heart disease. So uh, after valvular heart disease, we now come to the uh, atrial fibrillation guideline which came in 2020, the European Society of Cardiology. So for diagnosis of AF, uh, we need a standard 12 lead ECG recording or a single lead ECG tracing of more than 30 seconds, uh, showing heart rhythm with no discernible repeating T wave and an irregular RR interval. Now we have different uh, definitions of AF. We have clinical atrial fibrillation, which could be symptomatic or asymptomatic. We have subclinical atrial fibrillation and something that is called AHRE, that is atrial high rate episode, which is uh, uh, a device detected uh, rate and this uh, rate is standard uh, is 175 beats per minute so that is the usual thing and the criterion for ahre duration is usually set by the machine at uh, five minutes mainly to reduce the inclusion of artifacts so anything that is more than 175. now we have a classification for atrial fibrillation which is first diagnosed paroxysmal that is uh, terminated spontaneously or with intervention within seven days persistent that is sustained beyond seven days, including those terminated by cardioversion. Then you have long-standing persistent AF, that is continuous AF of more than one year duration. And finally, permanent AF, that is AF that is accepted by both the patient and the physician, and no further attempt is made to uh, uh, maintain sinus rhythm. And they have also recommended certain terminology that should be abandoned from routine use. That is one is lone atrial fibrillation, valvular and non-valvular AF, because it may confuse the issues. And finally, uh, the term of chronic atrial fibrillation. They have also uh, mentioned a 4 AF scheme, scheme, which is a structured characterization of atrial fibrillation. So we look at uh, four things, stroke risk classically assessed by the CHATSWA score, symptom severity by the EHRA, uh, European Heart Rhythm Association symptom score, severity of AF burden by the pattern of AF and uh, by the total burden of the atrial fibrillation. And finally, the substrate severity by clinical assessment and by imaging, including echo or CT or cardiac MRI. Of course, CHATSWA score, we all know, uh, based on congestive heart failure, hypertension, age, age, diabetes, stroke, vascular disease, and sex category being female. 
the European Heart Rhythm Association symptom scale in atrial fibrillation ranges from none, mild, moderate, severe to disabling symptoms due to atrial fibrillation. And six symptoms are included in this. That is palpitation, fatigue, dizziness, dyspnea, chest pain, and anxiety during atrial fibrillation. So this is important. The, uh, unlike the NYHA four symptoms, we have palpitation, fatigue, dizziness, dyspnea, chest pain, and anxiety that happen during the atrial fibrillation. Next is the HAS blood score, uh, which uh, assesses the bleeding risk. And we look at hypertension, abnormal renal or hepatic function, stroke, bleeding history or predisposition, labile INR, elderly, and drugs or excessive alcohol drinking. Now, the oral anticoagulation strategy, of course, the green one always is recommended in uh, score two or more in males and three or more in females, while it is class 2A in score one for male or two for female. Now. Uh, as per the all the current guidelines, NOAX are preferred over vitamin K antagonists in patients in, who are eligible for NOAX. And uh, the first three are available in India for our use, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban. The standard dose for dabigatran, 150 milligram twice daily, lower dose of 110 milligram twice daily, and doses reduced in patients with uh, uh, who are octogenarians, who have concomitant use of arapamil, or who have increased bleeding risk. The rivaroxaban, the standard dose is 20 milligram once daily along with meals and the reduced dose of 15 milligram mm -hmm. once daily is used if the creatinine clearance is 15 to 50. Apixaban, again, uh, the standard dose is 5 milligram twice daily. A lower dose of 2.5 milligram twice daily is used if patients uh, 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 have two out of three criteria, that is age more than 80, weight less than 60, or creatinine more than 1.5. Redoxaban is not uh, available here. So the next is the rate control strat therapy in atrial fibrillation. So uh, by definition, a lenient rate control is okay if the patient is uh, re uh, is, uh, is uh, reasonably all right symptomatically and the heart rate cutoff is less than 110 so lenient heart rate control 110 strict heart rate control is less than 80 and is uh, not routinely recommended uh, except in specific situations now uh, we have uh, uh, recommendations regarding cardioversion and of course uh, most commonly uh, we use uh, IV amiodarone and it is recommended for cardioversion in patients with heart failure or structural heart disease uh, in class 1 recommendation while other drugs that have class 1 recommendation are IV uh, vernacalant or flacanate or propofenone. Uh, so vernacalan, we should exclude patients with recent ACS or severe heart failure. Flacanate and propofenone exclude patients with severe structural heart disease. So cardioversion can be either early or delayed. So if it is within 48 hours of AF onset, you can go for early cardioversion, either pharmacological or electrical. And uh, it should be ideally after initiation of anticoagulation therapy. And the ideal candidate will be someone in whom the AF is clearly less than 12 hours and there is no previous history of thromboembolism and if the charts pass score is low. Uh, other patients uh, st uh, standard after, if it is after 48 hours, that is after two days, uh, it should be done after three weeks of therapeutic oral anticoagulation. And if the cardioversion has to be done within three weeks of therapeutic oral anticoagulation, we should do a transesophageal echocardiogram and exclude left atrial or left atrial appendage thrombus. And finally, uh, very important, decide on continued OAC after the cardioversion. So short term, that is four weeks OAC post cardioversion uh, if there is uh, the low chart score, zero in males or one in female. And uh, this is optional if the AF onset is definitely less than 24 hours. So, but for all other patients, uh, score more than one in male or more than two in female, long-term OAC is recommended. So only if it is score is zero or one, we may uh, stop short at four weeks of OAC post cardioversion. Now, uh, the secondary stroke prevention in whom uh, there has already been a stroke. So this is also very important uh, to me personally. Uh, so this, uh, uh, of course, so this guideline also recommends that uh, NOAC should be preferred over uh, vitamin K antagonists. And after an episode of an acute ischemic stroke, uh, anticoagulation should not be given for the first 48 hours. That's a class three recommendation. No form of anticoagulation in acute ischemic stroke. That is uh, using either unfractionated heparin or low molecular heparin or vitamin K antagonist. So these are not recommended in the first 48 hours. After an intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, we have to consider the risk benefit, fact, risk -benefit ratio very, uh, very, uh, very uh, specifically. And uh, two to four weeks after an intracerebral hemorrhage, that is class 2A recommendation. And if there are irreversible causes, we have to consider left atrial appendage occlusion also. 
So this guideline also mentions uh, some acronyms like CC to ABC, that is confirm AS, characterize AF with the forest scheme, and then the ABC pathway, that is anticoagulation to avoid stroke, better symptom control, very important in AF, and finally, address the comorbidities and the cardiovascular risk factor management. Now, uh, in 2021, this year, uh, in Europace, we had the uh, European Heart Rhythm Association practical guide on the use of NOAC. So this is a very important statement. This, I think we have already covered the doses for DVT and pulmonary embolism with all the uh, different agents. But uh, the last point is important. Even without uh, giving uh, initial upfront heparin or low molecular heparin, we can straight away start treatment with rivaroxaban 15 milligram twice daily for three weeks, followed by 20 milligram once daily uh, in uh, patients who are eligible. Now, uh, in coronary artery disease and peripheral arterial disease, based on the results of the COMPASS uh, trial, we now have the vascular dose of rivaroxaban, that is 2.5 milligram twice daily along with aspirin. Now, after orthopedic surgery, very, very important indication of uh, uh, DOAC, which has made things easier for the cardiologist and for the orthopedician, uh, the stand usual dose uh, use is rivaroxaban 10 milligram once daily or apixaban 2.5 milligram twice daily. Now, regarding the absorption and the metabolism, when you look at all these drugs, the uh, important thing to remember for, with regards to the Roxaban is the bioavailability is 100% with food, but it's only 66% without food. So it has to be taken along with the major meal of the day in a once daily basis. What about uh, chronic kidney disease use? Uh, uh, the uh, DOACs can be used uh, safely up to uh, an EGFR of uh, 30 ml uh, per minute, but below that, the data is uh, not much and uh, usually apixaban is uh, preferred in case of uh, lower uh, renal function and the lower doses are used as has been mentioned earlier. What about chronic liver disease in patients uh, 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 who have chronic liver disease? Of course, uh, a brotherly relationship to this specialty also. So uh, uh, liver disease who has in fact happened to be a, a Manipal graduate, my brother. So uh, Sudhakar might know. So uh, in patients who have uh, liver disease, of course, uh, we have to look at the child pew score based on the encephalopathy ascites, bilirubin, albumin, and INR, and uh, divide it into A, B, C. And uh, if child A, normal dose can be used. In child C, uh, all these drugs are not recommended. And in child B, we may use all the drugs, but uh, rubberoxaban use with uh, caution or even not recommended in child B. Uh, what about antidotes? Uh, if there is bleeding on DOAC with uh, dabigatran, we have idarosizumab, which is uh, given as 5 gram uh, IV in two consecutive infusions of 2.5 each. And if you uh, have bleeding on the uh, 10A inhibitors, you have andexanet alpha, which is again given as bolus and infusion. What about uh, uh, elective procedures? Uh, and how do you withdraw NOAC in somebody who is going for an elective procedure? It depends upon the kind of bleeding that you anticipate with the procedure, whether it is a low risk for bleeding or high risk for bleeding, and uh, whether uh, it is okay to discontinue or not. So uh, generally, if it is a high-risk procedure, we can stop it uh, two days before. If it is a low-risk procedure, we can stop the DOAC one day prior to uh, the procedure. And uh, if the creatine clearance is low, uh, naturally, uh, we have to give more time for the drug washout. So we can stop slightly earlier. And uh, resumption uh, with a full dose of NOAC should be done one day after low-risk low procedures and maybe by two to three days after a high-risk procedure. Now, uh, atrial fibrillation uh, with coronary artery disease requiring PCI anticoagulation. I think it's a very uh, a huge area of discussion and uh, dispute. So generally, uh, we have to consider whether it's an elective PCI or a PCI following an acute coronary syndrome. Triple therapy, uh, even though it brings down the thrombotic risk, uh, uh, increases the bleeding risk significantly. So it should be used uh, as uh, short of, uh, for as short a duration as possible. So uh, to one week or standard is uh, usually clinical practice. People use one month. So triple therapy, NOAC with uh, clopidogrel with aspirin. So triple therapy for maximum of one month and then continue with the dual therapy. And usually uh, when you use triple therapy, we don't use uh, uh, prasugrel or ticagrelor. It's aspirin with clopidogrel with a DOAC standard uh, therapy. So after uh, and uh, after one year, uh, the recommendation is to go for NOAC monotherapy, even though it is not uh, routinely practiced all over the country in the same way. 
Now, after uh, an ischemic stroke, uh, we have mentioned earlier regarding uh, stroke, you look at whether it is a TIA or a stroke with mild, moderate or severe neurological deficit. And restarting NOAC therapy uh, should be after repeat imaging, which should be done one day prior to planned restarting of the NOAC. So uh, for if it is a mild stroke, maybe three days later, moderate after one week and severe after two weeks. And if there is, but this is all without hemorrhagic transformation. And if there is hemorrhagic transformation, we have to individualize and usually uh, it is after two to uh, four weeks. So this is all based on expert opinion and no RCT data is available yet. Now, after an IC bleed, I had mentioned earlier, it should be reinitiated if uh, there is no other way after four to eight weeks, but should be considered for left atrial appendage exclusion also. Now, uh, regarding the use of DOACs in patients with extreme body weight that is very low or very high, the approved doses of DOACs can be used from a weight range from 60 to 120. But uh, sometimes we have patients who are morbidly obese. So in such patients, we cannot be sure about the, uh, the therapeutic effect. And so we may have to consider uh, vitamin K and agonists in these patients. So up to uh, overall around 120 kg, that's not a big issue. But after that, it might become a problem. Now, uh, what about cancer? So uh, traditionally, LMWH alone had been recommended in patients with cancer for uh, thromboembolism uh, prophylaxis. But now, uh, it, to make uh, life easier for these uh, uh, patients and for us who treat. Uh, NOAC can be used unless opted against by a multidisciplinary team or LMWH or VEK can be used. Uh, some few caveats are if the patient has got a GI malignancy with a high risk of GI bleed, uh, uh, we may withhold it, especially rivaroxaban, which has got slightly higher uh, GI bleed compared to the other. So these are some of the things that we look at. Now, uh, when swallowing is impaired, this is just for practical uh, importance when swallowing is impaired when we have to administer the drug through a Riles tube. So a crushed form uh, we can give apixaban and roxaban through a Riles tube and apixaban can also be given as oral solution or through nasogastric tube and the roxaban tablet can also be crushed or mixed in water and taken orally and can be given through the nasogastric tube. But the thing is, uh, the Davigatron capsules uh, must not be opened as it would result in a 75% increase in the drug bioavailability. If it is a capsule form, of course. So uh, after the DOAC, we now come to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy guideline in 2020 by the ACCHA. Uh, they have mentioned uh, certain risk factors for sudden cardiac death in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, six or seven important ones. One is family history of sudden death from HCM in a first degree or close relative below 50 years of age. Massive left ventricular hypertrophy defined as more than 30 millimeters in any segment, unexplained syncope, especially within six months of the valuation, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with uh, LV systolic dysfunction, EF less than 50%, LV apical aneurysm, very, very important, extensive late gadolinium enhancement on CMR imaging, more than 15% of LV mass, and finally, non-sustained VT on ambulatory monitoring, especially if it is, the runs are frequent, more than three, longer duration, more than 10 beats, and faster VTs, that is more than 200, beats per minute. So in patients who uh, have had a prior even a CD or a VF for a sustained VT, it's a class one recommendation for an implantable cardiac defibrillator. If not, we have to consider whether the patient has at least one of the risk factors mentioned earlier, and then it becomes a class 2A recommendation. Now, based on CMR and gadolinium enhancement alone, which is not included here, the recommendation is 2P, that is ICD may be considered. And if there is no gadolinium enhancement on MRI, an ICD is not indicated for primary prevention. Now, if at all we decide to put an ICD, what should be the device? It should be either a single chamber transvenous ICD or a subcutaneous ICD, and single coil ICD leads are preferred. What about drug therapy? In patients who have obstructive HCM with symptoms, uh, non-vasodilating beta blockers should be used. And if they are not tolerated or if they are ineffective, we can use verapamil and diltiazem. But uh, there is a class three caveat. If the resting gradient is more than 100, we should not use uh, verapamil. So it, should, it is potentially harmful. The role of disopramide is in patients who are symptomatic despite beta blocker or the calcium channel blockers. Now, what about septal reduction therapy? That is uh, SRT, which can be either surgical or alcohol septal ablation. The indication is if the patient has got obstructive HCM, despite treatment is symptomatic and has associated cardiac structural abnormalities, surgical myectomy is recommended. Alcohol septal ablation is also having a class one indication who, in whom surgery is contraindicated or if the risk is considered 
and acceptable. So the gradient uh, is mentioned is more than 50. P gradient is 50. That is the cutoff. In HCM, again, if the patient has got atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation is definitely recommended, independent of the chart spa score. So that is important. And here, uh, earlier, uh, only VK were recommended. Now, DOAC is considered as the first line option in HCM also. Now, coming to the 2020 ESC guideline for adult congenital heart disease, uh, they have classified the complexity of uh, congenital heart disease into mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, Epstein's anomaly, coarctation of aorta, repair TOF, TG after switch all come under moderate group, while in severe congenital adult congenital heart disease, uh, uh, Eisenmenger, uh, cyanotic congenital heart disease, unoperated or palliated, Fontan, TGA, uh, and uh, univentricular heart truncus, of course, come under the severe group. The pulmonary hypertension uh, subtypes have been defined in adult congenital heart disease into uh, pulmonary hypertension with a mean PA pressure cutoff of 20, uh, divided into pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, and combined, depending upon the conditions that exist. Now, regarding congenital heart disease and pregnancy risk in the adult, uh, the group which carry extremely high risk of maternal mortality and morbidity include pulmonary hypertension, severe LV dysfunction, systemic RV with uh, decreased ventricular function, complicated font, severe symptomatic ACE, severe metal stenosis, and severe aortic dilatation and severe coarctation. So these are the extremely high risk subgroup of patients. Regarding atrial septal defect, if there is RV volume overload and uh, if the PBR is less than five, we can go ahead with uh, closure. In adults, of course, we have to balance the risk and maybe do balloon testing uh, to look at the effect. In ventricular septal defect, again, if there is left ventricular volume overload and the PBR is uh, less than three or less than five, we can go ahead with the closure. And uh, the class of recommendation, of course, changes with the uh, PBR values. In PDA also, if there is evidence of LV volume overload, the PBR less than five and QPQ is more than 1.5, we can go ahead with closure. And uh, in coarctation of aorta in patients with arterial hypertension, the peak to peak gradient is more than 20, intervention is recommended. And if the, or the additional recommendation is more than 50% narrowing of the aorta, it's a class 2A recommendation. This, I think we have already seen in Marfan and in heritable thoracic aortic disease, the cutoff for the aortic sinus diameter, five centimeters standard, 4.5 centimeter with additional risk factor. In bicuspid aortic valve, a bit more lenient, more than 5.5 standard or five centimeter with a risk factor. And in Turner syndrome, especially above 16 years, the index should be taken because the height is important in these patients, 25 millimeter per meter square with an additional risk factor. In case of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, if the peak, uh, the, if it is severe peak gradient of more than 64, and if no valve substitute is required for intervention, this is a class one uh, recommendation regardless of the symptom. But if the valve substitute is required, we have to look at other factors like exercise capacity, RV function, RV systolic pressure, and evidence of right left shunt via NASD or uh, VSD. And if these are present, uh, it becomes a class one indication for intervention. Now, uh, patients with uh, TOF who had uh, the defect repaired, we know there are many long-term issues that we have to be careful about, including pulmonary regurgitation or RV outflow tract obstruction, tricuspid regurgitation, atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, peripheral pulmonary stenosis, aortic dilatation, AR, residual VSD, and LV and RV dysfunction. So uh, what about the recommendations for pulmonary valve replacement in patients with repaired TOF? Class one recommendation is in symptomatic patients with severe PR, and or at least moderate RV outflow tract obstruction. And uh, in patients who do not have a native outflow tract, catheter intervention uh, should be preferred if feasible. But in asymptomatic patients with severe PR and or RV outflow tract obstruction, when one of the following criteria are there, uh, it becomes a class 2A. So these are the additional criteria. One is a decrease in the objective exercise capacity. Second is progressive RV dilatation to more than 80 ml per meter square or end diastolic volume index more than 160 ml per meter square or progression of TR to at least moderate. Second is progressive RV systolic dysfunction, very important. And finally, RV outflow tract obstruction with an RVSP of more than 80. So these are some of the important values, especially when you have a patient with prepared top for the exam. Now, uh, next coming to the non-ST elevation MI uh, guideline for ESC 2020. 
uh, a new name has been uh, given. So NSTEMI is now known as NSTEACS, non ST elevation ACS. I'll just uh, look at the uh, differences. So overall, the treatment uh, remains the same. Uh, slight difference, Fonda Paranex has been given a class 1B recommendation, slightly more above uh, enoxaparin, which is class 2A recommendation. And Cangrelor has also been uh, mentioned. Now, what about the stratification and strategy? They divide into selective invasive, uh, early invasive, that is within one day, and immediate invasive within two hours. So, which are the patients uh, who should be taken for immediate invasive uh, approach in non ST elevation ACS, that is hemodynamic instability, cardiogenic shock, recurrent refractory chest pain, uh, life threatening arrhythmia, mechanical complications, acute heart failure and ST depression more than one millimeter in six leads with an ST elevation in AVR and or V1. So this is less than two hours like the STEMI protocol. Now, uh, another area which has been mentioned is Minoka, that is MI with uh, non-obstructive coronary arteries, uh, the diagnostic criteria based on the MI and also based on non-obstructive coronary arteries on angiography and non no specific alternative diagnosis for the clinical presentation. This uh, seems to be on the increase these days and uh, the assessment would include an LV angiogram, echo, cardiac MRI, and uh, importantly, the use of intravascular imaging and uh, probably functional testing, even though it is not frequently available. So we have to consider other uh, conditions also. Now coming to intervention, uh, we had a white paper on bifurcation PCI in 2020 by the European Bifurcation uh, Club. Uh, they have described the MATS2 uh, techniques, uh, M for main proximal first, A for main across side first, and B for double proximal lumen, and S for side branch first. And uh, uh, P stands for the POT, that is the proximal optimization technique, S for uh, side branch uh, balloon dilatation, and uh, K for the kissing balloon inflation. And uh, the one stent and the two stent techniques have been described, one stent being professional and inverted professional, two stent being T or tap stenting, culot and DK crush. And uh, they have given uh, simple, uh, easy to understand uh, uh, images uh, for professional tap, culot and DK crush you can uh, look at it uh, at leisure. Then uh, in uh, structural heart disease, uh, coming to structural intervention, we had uh, 2020 ACC expert consensus on uh, management of conduction disorders in patients undergoing TAVR. We know it is still uh, an Achilles heel of uh, TAVR, conduction disturbances, uh, heart blocks requiring pacemaker. So this is primarily because of the proximity of the aortic valve to the bundle of his, because the penetrating portion of the bundle of his is a ventricular structure, which is located within the uh, membranous portion of the ventricular septum. So you have the right and the non-coronary cusp of the aorta. You have the membranous septum, which is transilluminated in this specimen. So this is where the penetrating portion of bundle of his goes. So there are various risk predictors uh, regarding how uh, which patients will go on to develop heart block and requiring pacemaker. It can be either early, uh, that is intra-procedural or within 48 hours after discharge, uh, I mean, after the procedure or late, that is occurring after 48 hours uh, after the procedure and after discharge. So ECG predictors are pre-existing right bundle branch block and a first degree heart block. Uh, procedural features are uh, self or mechanically expanding processes, the uh, diameter uh, processes to LVOT diameter more than one, low anticipated implantation depth, technical factors, and anticipated use of balloon valvuloplasty. And CT predictors, of course, heavy calcification below the cusp and uh, short membranous septum. So these are important risk factors. Now coming to imaging. Uh, CT coronary angiography 2021 expert consensus document from the uh, Society of Cardiovascular Computed uh, Tomography, uh, Dr. Jagat uh, Narula and Dr. Uh, y. Chandrasekhar, the Jack Imaging editor. Uh, they, are, uh, they are the main authors. And this is the central uh, image, the role of CT angiography in chronic CAD. It's a first line test for uh, patients in whom there is no known coronary artery disease and those who have stable typical or atypical chest pain or anginal equivalent. And also for coronary anomalies and also in patients who had prior coronary artery bypass grafting. Uh, the uh, statement also gives uh, uh, importance to the emerging role of CT FFR, non-invasive functional assessment, and it might uh, become uh, the future of non-invasive uh, imaging for functional significance of coronary lesions. Coming to cardiac uh, MRI, I think my uh, 
fellow Dr. Happy's favorite topic right now. So this is the SEMR position paper on clinical indications for cardiovascular MRI. And uh, of course, the main role uh, uh, is in uh, cardiomyopathy where it is of extreme importance. And uh, the 2018 Lake Louis criteria has been uh, shown which is uh, to detect myocarditis and non-ischemic myocardial inflammation based upon the main criteria that is myocardial edema and evidence of myocardial injury and also the supportive criteria with pericarditis and systolic LV dysfunction, which can be either regional or global. So it is the Lake Louis criteria. Now coming to uh, COVID about which, uh, of course, we should talk uh, at least a bit because we know the different phases and the inflammatory uh, responses. So this was the first uh, case report which came in European Journal of Heart Failure in 2020 regarding the first case of myocardial localization of coronavirus in, the, in cardiogenic shock. So first uh, report where in a patient with 69 year old male with shock underwent ECMO and underwent endomyocardial biopsy. You can see the uh, biopsy uh, specimen showing the coronavirus particles inside the uh, myocardial interstitium. So that is the first uh, direct order. But fortunately, direct myocarditis has been rare, but though we sometimes see patients who come for follow-up after COVID having features of uh, uh, myocarditis and uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Then the 2020 ESC, uh, there was a, a COVID guidance and uh, they recommended uh, approaches towards non ST elevation ACS during COVID, whether it is very high, high intermediate or low risk. If it is very high risk, we have to follow the STEMI pathway. Otherwise, test for COVID-19 and proceed with the strategy, which is uh, tailored to the hospital and availability of cath lab and, uh, of course, COVID containment measures. If it is a STEMI during COVID, the guidelines recommended that if uh, patients go to hospitals with uh, uh, primary PCA facility, uh, they should undergo primary PCA, taking all precautions if there is a separate cath lab and if there is a separate ICU for managing these patients, otherwise go for thrombolysis. And an additional delay of 60 minutes was uh, given uh, as a leeway in because of the COVID pandemic. Now, initially, if you remember, uh, we used to take a lot of HCQS to prevent uh, development of COVID. And at that time, the Indian Heart Rhythm Society had uh, come up with a scientific statement on the use of uh, uh, looking at the relation between QT interval and the risk uh, with the HCQS therapy. So there they had mentioned that if the QTC is more than 500 and if the uh, COVID risk is low, preferably we have to use it or avoid or use with caution. But now, of course, because we are not using it, uh, the relevance is not much. Now, uh, this is the uh, a position paper of ESC on endothelial dysfunction in COVID. We know there is a lot of endothelial uh, inflammation and prothrombotic state. And so anticoagulation becomes an important area where cardiologists are often uh, consulted for use. So uh, this is the American Society of Hematology 2021 came this year. And uh, overall, they have recommended that uh, prophylactic dosage of anticoagulation is better than uh, high dose or therapeutic dose or intermediate dose. So prophylactic dose is good enough in hospitalized patients. And this would be equivalent to enoxaparin 40 milligram sub-Q OD, fibroxaban 10 milligram once daily, apixaban 2.5 milligram twice daily, unfractionated heparin 5,000 units sub-Q BD or Fonda Paranax 2.5 milligram sub-Q OD. So moderate dose is uh, prophylactic dose is good enough. Now, this came uh, this month, June 2021, in NEJM, uh, report of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia after the adenoviral vector vaccine, uh, which happened with the venous thrombosis and thrombocytopenia happened almost one week after the first dose of this vaccine in five healthcare workers. And in all these patients, antibodies to plated factor four complexes were detected, as in the case of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And so they have given a name to this new entity uh, that vaccine induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia. So we have to be on the lookout for these things also. So uh, you now coming to heart failure, uh, ACC 2021 update, uh, which just come. They have mentioned the different drug groups, ARNI, AC inhibitor or ARB, evidence-based beta blockers, diuretics, aldosterone antagonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, hydralazine isosorbide dinitride combination, and evabradine. So uh, in stage C treatment, ARNI is preferred over AC inhibitor or ARB along with the beta blocker. And uh, if the EGFR is more than 30, and if the creatinine is less than 2.5 in males, less than two in females, and if the potassium is less than five, we can add aldosterone antagonist and SGLT2 inhibitor and diuretic for symptoms and uh, hydralazine isosorbide dinitrate for patients who are persistently symptomatic. And for patients in whom the heart rate remains above 70, Vibradin is recommended. Uh, slight differences in the EF cutoffs in the indication for ARNI and SGLT2, the EF cutoff is 40, while in Ivabradin it is 35%. 
this is an acronym uh, they have given to assist in decision making to decide on which patient to refer to an advanced heart failure center i need help that is i for iv inotrop n for nyha higher grades higher classes e for endogen dysfunction e for ejection fraction less than 35% d for defibrillator shock h for more than one hospitalization e for edema l for low blood pressure and high heart rate and p for prognostic medication or medication intolerance of course uh, it sounds too complicated i think uh, we can all make uh, clinical judgments based on these and other factors so uh, next uh, of course uh, we have the heart failure therapy which now has four pillars uh, in addition to arni or ras blockers with beta blockers or mris we now have the uh, sglt2 inhibitors which uh, have uh, really taken the world by storm so uh, they are now called the fantastic four along with uh, various other uh, drugs and devices that we have but of course in a country like ours we definitely have to consider the cost of health also and whether it is becoming uh, whether it is uh, uh, it can be tolerated by uh, majority of our patients and uh, in fact on one of the meetings it was mentioned that uh, sgl2 inhibitors can be used in uh, so much of pleiotropic benefits that the only two areas where it is it probably won't work are uh, uh, i think uh, covid and uh, uh, treatment of infertility but now uh, that joke has been proven wrong because people have also tried it in uh, uh dapagliflozin in covid-19 respiratory failure patients but uh, it was not uh, the dar 19 study but it was not found to be uh, beneficial uh the arnis also uh, in the paradise mi trial the subset after mi when they were compared with uh, ramipril there was no significant difference and so uh, they were almost the same benefit another molecule which came with a bang and then uh, went with the wind it was launched in india with much fanfare fanfare the was uh, lorcaserin which is a drug for Uh, weight loss and which stimulates the 5HT receptors and uh, suppresses uh, appetite and this was also withdrawn by the FDA in US because of the increased risk of cancer coming to devices after drugs we have subcutaneous ICD the Praetorian trial which came in NEJM in 2020 uh, uh, we know that uh, it uh, in this trial it was compared with transvenous uh, ICD and was found to be non inferior with uh, lesser uh, procedural and long term uh, side effects and uh, but uh, in between one model the emblem is uh, subcutaneous icd had to be recalled over electrolyte uh, uh, electrode fractures now uh, a new drug for heart failure the omicam to uh, macarbil that is the selective cardiac myosin activator was uh, tried in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction in the galactic hf Uh, trial i think uh, uh, interesting name my son would love it because he's a space enthusiast so among patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction uh, had, they had a lower incidence of a composite of heart failure in the death from cardiovascular causes now uh, an old drug is having a, a resurgence digoxin again for permanent uh, atrial fibrillation as was seen in the rate af trial where digoxin was compared to bisoprolol for heart rate control in atrial fibrillation came in uh, the end of december uh, 2020 so there was no significant difference so uh, digoxin might be on the way up now regarding hcm uh, mavac camden uh, for uh, uh, the cardiac myosin inhibitor in symptomatic obstructive uh, hcm was tried in the explorer hcm trial so it improved exercise capacity uh, brought down lvot obstruction improved functional class and health status and it was also tried in symptomatic patients with non obstructive hcm and the maverick hcm trial and uh, was found to bring down the indices of diastolic dysfunction and nt pro bnp and troponin levels the uh, apart from the uh, statins and the uh, icosap and ethyl and the pcsk9 inhibitors we uh, now have one more uh, drug uh, coming up for uh, lipids that is bempedoic acid which inhibits the atp citrate lyase two steps upstream of the hmg coa reductase and 120 mg per day of bempedoic acid lowered ldl cholesterol by 23% uh, so that is uh, the new drug and now uh, uh, we uh, had the leadless uh, pacemaker now we are having the atrioventricular synchronous pacing using the leadless ventricular pacemaker uh, based on the marvel 2 study so basically it's an accelerometer based uh, atrial sensing so there is a lead uh, the the uh, pacemaker is now in the ventricle itself but it will sense the uh, uh, atrial uh, movement and it's a Uh, sensing with uh, sort of like a VDD uh, pacing, and uh, it has now come up in a big way and has been uh, shown to produce much more uh, better AV synchrony. So again, the next area in pacing is the uh, physiological pacing. We have the his bundle pacing and the left bundle branch pacing, which are coming up in a big way and uh, probably uh, becoming the uh, 
better approaches, if not the best approaches to physiological pacing. And uh, the best is, in fact, uh, uh, by none other than uh, Dr. Alan Bogan himself. So in this article, uh, you have uh, the differences between his bundle pacing and uh, left bundle uh, branch area pacing, uh, which is uh, beautifully given as a table. You can uh, look it up. Now coming to coronary interventions, uh, uh, after ROTA, now we have the intravascular lithotripsy, shockwave lithotripsy for calcific coronaries, which is now available in India and have been, uh, it has been, the use has been on the increase. So uh, finally, uh, we come to the smart wearable devices, the era of smart uh, technology and uh, uh, usage of the Apple Watch. We know that uh, in the initial Apple Heart study, uh, almost one third of the patients who received notification of arrhythmia turned out to have atp relation and now with the uh, with the newer models of apple uh, apple watch 4 they use electrodes to generate a single lead ecg and uh, provide mechanisms for rhythm assessment so it has been is being used now the people in uh, mayo clinic and uh, i think cleveland they have started looking at uh, uh, giving uh, apple watches for uh, post op patients to detect af in post cardiac surgery patients and in the US, of course, with the increasing uh, legalization of marijuana, there has been increased uh, uh, detection of cardiovascular disease and abnormalities. And people are now on the lookout for this. So it's a time for education there. And uh, finally, uh, uh, for, for those of you who are space enthusiasts or uh, to whom the future belongs, so this is the heart in space because India's space program is also increased uh, on the uh, on the roll. So uh, regarding uh, the Astro Chum, and uh, I think all of you know that Jeff Bezos is going to space with his brother uh, soon. So uh, the uh, American College of Cardio, they have actually uh, devised an Astro Chum, uh, that is a risk scoring system incorporating coronary calcium. Now that uh, the astronauts need to have a calcium score of less than 10, uh, otherwise they won't be sent to space. And uh, somebody had even and uh, calculated the uh, average door to uh, balloon time if an astronaut develops an MI in space supposed to be 28 hours to dock to the International Space Station and bring the astronaut back home. So uh, this is the Astro Cham, which is a, a scoring system for uh, astronauts. So maybe in, uh, we may have uh, jobs like this in future. And uh, if, uh, you have to definitely watch out for new releases because uh, uh, guidelines in cardiology are like uh, uh, iPhone models. They keep uh, coming up uh, all the time. So a lot of guidelines uh, related to sudden cardiac death, uh, non-cardiac surgery, cardiac oncology, pulmonary hypertension, cardiac pacing, they're all uh, up for grabs. So to uh, rewind, uh, we looked at new things with regards to basic sciences, uh, right from anatomy to physiology, to biochemistry, to microbiology. We looked at preventive cardiology, uh, exercise recommendations, uh, smoking. We looked at heart failure, the new guidelines, the updates and use of urine sodium. We looked at intervention, both coronary and structural, including uh, TAVR, and we looked at uh, arrhythmias and also pacing, left bundle branch pacing, and uh, leadless, uh, AV synchronous uh, leadless pacing. We looked at uh, new drugs for heart failure, dyslipidemia, and also looked at imaging, uh, especially CT and MRI. I had a look at the COVID guidelines and also looked at the valvular heart disease guidelines, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrillation, uh, newer anticoagulants. Uh, rational use from ESC, adult congenital heart disease, hypertension, uh, lipid guidelines, and also non ST elevation ACS. So uh, hope uh, we will uh, progress further and uh, not sleep uh, off like uh, this gentleman. Thank you so much. Dr. Sudhagar, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. I think what we need to read for next many days you have covered in almost uh, 75 minutes of the class like it's almost uh, excellent talk sir and almost everything is covered from the guideline i think from uh, 2020 what has started and until uh, i think last two days what has come everything is covered almost sir uh, you. i will uh, share this uh, presentation yeah. with you so uh, you can share it so they can just go through the slides before the exam Sure. Yes, sir. I think this is what uh, actually is very much uh, like the we before we used to think it is the army we used to know now after that as GLT2 inhibitors have come in heart failure in uh, in the preserved ejection fraction it's coming and then in non-diabetic it is coming and then something like the new statins colchicine has become the new statin it's coming up in almost everywhere. Then as you told very you go out to all the new drugs which has been coming it's very difficult to keep us up to date. Correct, correct. Every day, one day. 
coming and the trials keep changing and the most confusing remains the dap trials and DAP. yeah correct correct DAP. yeah correct correct so i think a uh, lot of a uh, lot of information uh, coming up it's difficult for us to keep abreast of it all so uh, these platforms are good so that we can yes sir uh, you have covered it very nicely in the actually enjoyed a lot and it's very uh, useful for the students just before uh, walking in the exam room in the last 30 minutes of their spotters or table viva sir but I, I would uh, tell the, all the PGs who are here, I mean, whoever is here, it's not uh, just about uh, right. I mean, uh, passing the exam. So, uh, uh, yeah, because these are things that uh, that change the way we uh, understand the disease, uh, change the way we practice uh, our speciality and uh, improve the quality of care also. So uh, that is also, that is very, very important because the exam is just one part of our yeah. life, but we uh, have, we practice cardiology throughout our life. So. That is very, very important. Right, sir. Any other thing you want to add, sir, for the students, like what they need to know before the exam on this? Uh... Why? Oh, okay. Because this is going to be, I mean, uh, okay, off the record, even though it is being recorded, right. uh, even though it is being recorded, I'll just tell a few things off the record. Uh, basically, uh, examination is like, I mean, uh, you are going uh, to a battlefield, so you need to know the battleground and who your opponents are in this case the examiners so different examiners will have different areas of interest naturally so uh, a bit of research into the examiners uh, area of expertise and uh, what uh, that uh, person is going to uh, uh, ask so these uh, might help because on the exam day invariably you will not be uh, at your usual uh, i mean a level of uh, uh, expertise so because even uh, you might forget the uh, things that you would ordinarily remember quite well because of the stress of the exam uh, you may not perform to your best so uh, it is good to have some background check uh, uh, focus on the areas uh, and uh, mo mo many examiners will uh, ask you i mean like uh, which is the last article you read or something like that so something related to your thesis so all those things it'll it'll add to the uh, add to your quality of presentation and also i think uh, uh, I, I was also asked, asked asked these questions. I think uh, Prabhavati Madam was the, the one of my examiners. I saw Madam's name. I don't know whether Madam is there. Uh, so it is not always uh, smooth sailing for the exam. So uh, keep a positive frame of mind. And uh, that's all. Don't try to be uh, uh, I mean, uh, very dogmatic. Be open-minded. And uh, just be honest with your uh, presentations. And uh, remember that uh, exam is not uh, everything. Fortunately, most of the examiners also uh, are uh, not very uh, dogmatic uh, these days. So they will also understand your predicaments. Uh, so and uh, just uh, be aware of the basic. Don't make uh, big mistakes. That's all. Uh, all your examiners have big hearts. We are cardiologists, no? So that they have, they will right. take care of you well. Right, sir. So I think we uh, had a very nice session, sir. Thank you very much for this. I think this was one of the very important session. I think I always believe that for a student, it takes too much time to go through all this and we need to know what we have to read. Correct. correct. What we have to focus. So you, uh, in that next, in that 75 minutes, you at least focus on what we should, they should know in the, and what they have to read before the exam, important trials, guidelines and their drugs. So I think, uh, We'll conclude this session here, sir. Again, thank you so much. Over to Rahul. Any final words? Sir? Thank you, Dr. Sudhakar, you, for organizing Dr. this. Madam, sir, oh, ma here. Uh, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Madam is there. Okay. Madam was an examiner. <laughs> no, good that you didn't tell. I would have been afraid to talk. <laughs> ah, Madam was my examiner. She's a very loving examiner. <laughs> After the exam also. I think it was an excellent... Oh, uh, madam, you are there. Okay. Yeah, I enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Always very nice. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Hope you are fine. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. And Dr. Sudhagar, uh, congrats to you for organizing all these programs and uh, keeping, keeping up the academic mood. Uh, I, yeah. But one thing I uh, note recently is that there are a lot of programs happening no, for postgraduates. Yes, uh, 
different people are organizing from different areas so i think it's uh, there are a lot of programs so now uh, what i see is people uh, just uh, record <laughs> record the presentation they don't listen to it so it's like uh, you take print out of uh, hundreds of articles and just keep it there without reading so now i think pgs will have folders and folders of recorded talks uh, so that should not happen i think uh, especially when uh, master teachers like madam and uh, uh, all talk i think listening to them uh, will be good right sir yeah right okay take care everyone uh, yes sir all so the best you, yeah yeah rahul anything from your side yes uh, at the outset sir let me first uh, thank you uh, for uh, being there sir and assisting the students sir uh, from our perspective also sir it was a good exhaustive session and uh, it covered lot of aspects so thank you sir thank you dr sajan and uh, on behalf of torrent i always say that our platforms are always available for this kind of academic initiatives and we look forward to conduct many such pg bonanza webinar series in the times to come also take care and thank you dr sudhakar sir thank you dr sajan sir and thank you thank you everyone thank you very much i think torrent has always been in the forefront of pg education right from my md days i used to remember used to organize lot of pg programs so that's great that's in in fact the virtual platforms have been much more boon in this current pandemic sir because <laughs> of late in uh, almost every week we've been doing it uh, so it's been very encouraging sir. thank you thank you right. to you, sir. Thank yeah. you sir okay bye, bye. Sir. good night bye, bye everyone yeah right